uta kia mā taratara ki tai. E hi ake ana te atukura. He tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti he mauriora. Welcome everyone this morning. I declare this meeting open. Uh, we're, this is the first meeting of the Safer Speeds Hearing Subcommittee. And um, as we were saying before we started this live stream, it's my very first set of hearings, which I'm chairing. And, and Heidi Muller, who's our um, assistant uh, from Democracy Services today, is her very first hearing as well. So we're having a delightful time learning new skills. And um, please note that this meeting is being live streamed. And are there any apologies, Heidi? I don't have any. None, no. Thank you. So I don't have any apologies. And I don't have, have any conflict of interest declarations. Does anyone have a conflict of interest to declare? I don't see any. There are no items not on the agenda. And we don't have public participation because the whole meeting is public participation. So that brings us to suspension of standing orders. So I'm moving that understanding order 2.4, temporary suspension of standing orders, that we suspend standing order 27.7 division in order to allow the division be recorded by a show of hands rather than taking down names. So because we're on Zoom, we're suspending this, this standing order. I need a 75% majority for this to pass. Can I move the motion? Do I have a seconder? Councillor Rush, I got lots of waves. Thank you, everybody. All right, Heidi, can we open that for a vote? Voting is open. All right. Councillor Sparrow, just waiting on you. Oh, apologies, Councillor Sparrow, you're not part of the subcommittee. Uh... He's just visiting. Just visiting, yes. Well, we love having visitors. Thanks for joining us, Councillor Sparrow. Yeah, well, we have correct. eight four, which is more than the 75%. Excellent. Required. We'll take it. Thank you, Heidi. All right. And then moving on to general business, um, I'm going to move the motion being recommended in the off officer's report, which is that we receive this information and hear the oral submitters and thank them for speaking to their submissions. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Matthews, thank you. We put this to a vote now, Heidi? Yes, we'll put it to the vote and then we'll receive the submissions from the speakers. Lovely, all right. How are we doing there? Uh, we have seven, four. We are missing We're missing Mia Foster who's not at the meeting. I'm just observing. <laughs> I wasn't on that. Uh, now we have eight. We have eight. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks, Heidi. Cool. Unanimous. Nice to have you, Deputy Mayor. Um, alrighty, so we're ready to now move on into our public participation. Thank you to everyone who's joining us today on Zoom. Um, and thanks for um, re-accommodating us at this time of COVID-19 to, to make your submissions this way. We really appreciate it. Now we've got um, individual submitters will have five minutes. Heidi's going to be keeping time for me and I will let you know when you have one minute left to go. Heidi, we we do questions at hearings as we would in a normal part public participation if there's time left. We do, yes. Yes. So if we've if you want to leave some time for questions, um, speakers, please do, but that will come out of your five minutes. And Councillor Paul, you were waving at me. How can I help you? Uh, thank you. Just wondering what time we have a um, bathroom break. Just wondering so I can prepare myself. <laughs> sure. Good question. So we are we've got public participants scheduled until eleven o'clock this morning. And then we will adjourn the meeting and we will come back at one o'clock for the afternoon session. So even though in our diaries it's blocked out for four hours, councillors, we're actually doing one hour and then a break and then another hour. Excellent. All righty. So I've got Kate Jensen is on my speaking list first. Um, Kate, if you'd like to unmute yourself and 
as I say, Hayley will let me know when you've got one minute left and I will give you a heads up on that. Right. Um, and just to all the public participants, once you've um, once you've finished your presentation, you can jump out of this meeting and if you're particularly keen, you can go and watch us on YouTube to see the, re the rest of the meeting. So Kate, welcome. Thank you for coming along today. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to submit today. Um, I'm concerned about safe, safer speeds in our, especially in the CBD, um, but, but generally in Wellington, um, primarily because I've, a while ago, I, I found out that at 30 kilometers an hour, um, a human, a body that's not enclosed, enclosed in a metal shell in a car or truck or anything, um, will quite possibly survive a impact with a car or other vehicle, um, but beyond that speed, they won't. Um, so that's my, the most important point I wanna make is that um, for the safety of uh, more vulnerable members of the community and anyone who's not in a car is more vulnerable than anyone who is in a car, for instance. Um, I believe that the only safe speed is 30 kilometers or less where there are pedestrians or cyclists present on the road without any barrier between them and the road and being on a footpath doesn't really count as a barrier because cars can move onto the footpath if um, something goes wrong. Um, and another, the other major point I want to make is that it, it seems and it is clear that cities are designed for vehicles and not for people. And um, that seems just so wrong because what are cities for? Are they for vehicles? Are they for machines? Or are they for people? Are they for people to enjoy peaceful use of the city environment? And if so, how does that um, combine with noisy vehicles rushing by? You know, I've stood on the side of the road um, trying to talk to people, and uh, because I do a lot of protest activism, trying to inform people about important things to do with climate change as a climate activist. And honestly, it's completely impossible to hear anyone saying anything when a bus is going by around about half a meter away from you if you're in front of, for instance, the Majestic Center on Willis Street. So the ability for someone to have an enjoyable experience walking down a central Wellington Street or perhaps even somewhere like Newtown in the middle of uh, this, the shopping center in Newtown, it's very, very difficult um, to actually just have an enjoyable time there as a pedestrian and certainly the one time I've taken a bike into the center of the CBD I live in Paraparumu so I don't get in with a bike that often but when I did ride in there I, I just about got wiped out by a car on Victoria Street um, on what was supposed to be a bike lane but uh, very rapidly there was no room for a bike there um, so that experience left me shaken and I didn't repeat the um, haven't taken a car, uh, sorry, a bike into the center of town, um, into that part of town anyway. And um, so I just want to say that to give people an enjoyable experience and to encourage pedestrians and cyclists in the middle of town, it's really important that cars are moving sedately um, if they're present at all, um, but that's another matter. Um, so I encourage council to make sure that cars are traveling at a safe speed anywhere where there are pedestrians and cyclists present. And that's that's really all I have to say, but I think thank those you, points are very, very, hopefully that clear. Yes, thank you very much, Kate. Councillors, do I have questions? Councillor Foon, I see you. Councillor Rush. Hi, Kate, thank you for coming to speak to us today. Can I just ask you about your near miss on Victoria Street? Um, was that actually in one of our bike lanes? And how, how long ago was it? Um, that was not long after I first came to this area. So it would have been perhaps, I'm trying to think, uh, maybe August last year. Um, and I was cycling um, towards the Basin Reserve area. I'm not, my geography of the centre of town isn't that clear, but um, it was after, um, I'm trying to think where I was. Um, it was in an attempt to get to the top of Willis Street. So it was where Willis Street became one way going the other way. And that first block, when you oh. go on that part of Willis Street, 
uh, uh, sorry, in, onto that part of Victoria Street, there are two bike lanes marked, one on either side, but on the right hand one, there's actually no room for a bike. There's only a yellow line with no bike lane. So I, I went onto the right side, not realizing that. And then I had to move from there to where the bike lane was, which was across a couple of lanes of traffic. And I was having trouble at that point. I was quite um, worried for my safety. And another car was um, trying to think what happened, but it was, I had a car behind me and there was a car to the side and it was very difficult for me to get, you know, in between onto where the bike lane was. And I, I had a sort of heart stopping moment where I, I kind of had to be in the middle of the two lanes. So that was, that was my, my near miss there. Thanks for sharing that. And I'm sorry to hear that because I know that can really put you back that kind of experience. Yeah. Thanks for coming in today. Yes, thank you, Kate. Sorry, Councillor Rush, we've used our five minutes. Yep, so no, no, I was going to say. Appreciate that. Thanks so, Kate, so much, Kate, for coming in. And um, we will go on to our next um, participant, which is Alistair Rose. Shalom. Um, I'm uh, speaking to you uh, as part of a, uh, an interest around the city centre uh, and that I live in the city centre. Um, but <clears throat> Mostly my expertise comes to this forum as a former police officer in the road policing unit in Wellington. Um, and also now as my speciality in health and safety as a consultant in Wellington. Um, primarily, uh, the, the one thing that, that concerns me about, about this is that it, it, to me it seems that it's the idea around speed is one eye. Um, and by that, I mean, that there's actually a lot more, uh, there's a lot more things that go into causing accidents uh, than, than just speeds. And, and there's a lot of other controls that we can use now. And I would urge you to look at what London have done with, uh, with their inner city congestion. Um, I was in London for a health and safety conference in September last year, and it's been some years since I have been in London. Like most Kiwis, I spent some time there and doing the OE thing and got to know London quite well. But that was probably 25 years ago. On, on this trip uh, to London, I, I was amazed how the inner city was so different. Uh, there's there's uh, a lot more pedestrian zones. It's a lot easier to walk around Covent Garden, for instance. Um, when I was last in Covent Garden, there were cars everywhere. Um, the, the other thing is that, that in London, they use ANPR, which is automated number plate recognition. And they use ANPR to drive the driver behavior. Um, in particular, um, noisy exhausts. A particular type of person likes a noisy exhaust and they don't generally give a shit about you. <laughs> that's why they have a noisy exhaust. They want to draw attention to themselves and they drive, in my experience as a police officer, they drive very poorly. Um, police do have the ability to police noisy exhausts. Uh, there's, a, there's a fine for uh, having a noisy exhaust and it also carries demerit points. It's only a $50 fine, but it comes with, well, from memory, 20 demerits. Police don't, don't generally enforce noisy exhausts because they tend to concentrate on what's called the fatal five. So that's speed, drug and alcohol, intersections, and a number of others. I can't remember, it's been a long time since I've got the, the policy. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and they have a number, they, ha they have what they call PREC codes. And you give out a certain PREC code or a certain offense code. Noisy exhausts come under a V PREC code. The V PREC code means that you don't get any SAP or any, any um, traffic hours allocated to you. So if you gave out a ticket for a noisy exhaust under a V code, you effectively aren't 
sort of complying, for want of a better word, uh, with uh, expectations of the police that you should give out X amount of tickets under the fatal five. Um, other other examples of of the of the V prep codes are uh, warrant fitness, um, registration. So they're they're really low down. They're they're, they're not considered to be trauma reducing um, codes. So they're not heavily policed. But on the other hand, from from my experience, drivers Got one who minute, drive, Alistair. One minute. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, also, uh, in that one minute, I need to squeeze in um, um, taxing in the city cars. That uh, with ANPR, you can also tax cars. So the congestion is really the problem. It's not so much the not so much the speed, but I would urge you to concentrate on on the London example. So you have to you get taxed if you go into the inner city of London, um, and also driver behaviour. And you can you can monitor driver behaviour uh, through exhausts. There you go. Thank you, Alison. Much sure. Thank you, uh, Councillor Young. I saw your hand up earlier. Oh, you're muted, Councillor Young. Um, he, uh, Alice has answered my question, so that's fine. Thank oh, you. Oh, okay, excellent. Could I ask a question? Sure, Councillor Rush. Yeah, um, just in your experience in as a police officer, so are you saying that speed, uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand where the speed actually is causing, um, you know, serious accidents in the inner city? Uh, well, it's probably one contributor, um, but there's, it's like everything, it's not the silver bullet, is it? There's a lot of things that go into it. And, and I think that, that was the driver of my point is that you can't just concentrate on speed. It's not going to solve the problem. There's a whole lot of other things that you do that you can do. And I would urge you to look at London because New Zealanders, for some reason, think we, 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 we're so good at this sort of thing. INSYS, for instance, is, is the, the police computer. It was a complete debacle. We could have just bought something off the shelf. And we're really good at that in New Zealand, just thinking that we, we can come up with the answers ourselves. But nine times out of ten, it's already been done. We just need to look overseas and see how they've done it. Thank you, Alistair, for coming Cheaper in today. As well. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Thanks so much, Alison, for coming in. All right. Uh, the next speaker I've got is Callum McMenamin. Howdy. Howdy. Um, so, yeah, kia ora koutou. I'm pleased to present you um, why I think 30 is less 30 as a speed limit in our central city. Um, and I also have visual impairment, so I hope to bring like a disability perspective to this issue. Um, and because of that, I'm always a pedestrian. So um, I come from a place of staunch pedestrianism. Um, and the central city is my neighborhood. Um, and finally, I'm really emphatic about making our streets safe, um, usable and accessible to all humans. Um, about one quarter of Kiwis have some kind of disability. So it's not really a minority. Um, so that's important to think about. And by 2051, about a quarter of us will be over the age of 65. So we've got an aging population in New Zealand. So we need to design our cities to be fit for purpose for our future populations. Um, and because I'm visually impaired, sometimes crossing the street can be quite dangerous for me. Um, about a week ago, I was crossing Kent Terrace um, when the crossing made the beeping sound telling me it was safe to cross. Um, however, there was a car going 50 k's an hour down the road that decided to ignore the red light um, and I couldn't see the oncoming car and I sort of felt the rush of air as it went past me. It was that close. Um, so I was quite lucky that day, but if I wasn't that lucky, I was wondering like, hmm, what would happen? So I started looking into some research um, and I found that the Department for Transport in London found there was a 10% risk of death if you're hit by a car going 50 k's. And that goes from 10% down to 1% if you reduce the speed limit to 30 k's an hour, as we're proposing. Um, so it's a 90% reduction in the risk of mortality. But for people that are over 60, they have a 60% chance of death if they're hit by a car at 50 k's an hour. And it goes from 60% down to 5% if you reduce the speed limit to 30 k's. So 
older populations are far more vulnerable um, to, to dying if they're hit by a car, which seems pretty um, sort of common sense. So the research shows from the Department of London that 30 is less hurty as a speed limit. Um, and I also found that the National Research Council in the US um, showed that uh, a reduction in speed from 50 to 30 k's um, created a 17% reduction in CO2 emissions. So it might make our air cleaner, um, perhaps. And finally, I believe that the city is for the human, not the car. We've designed our built environments to prioritize the car. This was a mistake. We traded away human lives in beautiful cities because it was convenient for cars. It was a misstep that enabled suburban sprawl, polluted air, noisy and dangerous streets, and it robbed us of the space humans could have used to spend time with each other instead of being atomized and alone inside individual mass-produced aluminium boxes on wheels, panicking to find a place to park while shouting at the traffic. Thank you. Thanks, Callum. Can I take any questions? Uh, Councillor Matthews. Kia ora, Callum. Um, really lovely to see from you and hear from you again. Um, and I guess I'm just interested in your research. I'm interested, that's the first time I've heard about that difference between elderly pedestrians being um, hit by cars. And I'm wondering if you saw any research about the impact of you know, these kind of accidents on disabled people versus people that don't have a physical disability, because I, I think a lot of the, the factors that go into this kind of research tends to have a, you know, it, it focuses on, on people who don't, you know, already have any existing, you know, health conditions. Um, in, in my research, I couldn't find any studies done on um, traffic accidents with um, disabled people specifically. Um, so that's why I, I gave data on elderly people who have um, mobility issues and, and things like that as the next best option. Thank you. Any other questions, councillors? Councillor Rush. Yeah, Callum, I, thanks very much for all that. Um, there is some conflicting uh, evidence in the study, but in studies that I've seen. But anyway, just I, I really want to. Um, delve into this idea that cities are made for people and, and not for cars. Of course, that's correct. Of course, streets, though, and roads uh, have been designed for cars in that sense to enable us all to go visit friends, families, cafes, gyms, all that sort of thing. So, so how, do you, how do you balance that between uh, the needs of those people who need to get out and, and use the car, the road, and so forth to, to do those sort of activities we all love to do, uh, uh, you know, with um, what you were saying about how we really need to, to shut these things down in order that we can sort of all live together and, and uh, integrate with one another. Um, I never said they should be shut down. Um, perhaps we need to change the way that we use these streets and prioritise mass transit instead of atomised individual vehicles. Okay, thanks. Yep, Thank you're you, right. Callum. Thanks so much for coming along today, Callum. Nice to see you again. Thanks. And my next presenter is Isabella Cawthorn. Morning, Alice, Is Isabella. Kia ora koutou, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. It's, it goes without saying that, that nothing in this world is really simple, and that you folk as councillors will know that better than most of us. However, there is in cities one really nice either or, where it's pretty black and white, and that is either you can make streets that are convenient and pleasant to drive through, or you can have streets that are pleasant and great places to be. You genuinely can't have a single street that is both of those things at the same time. You can look anywhere you want in the world. If it is a nice place to drive, if it is convenient and smooth, it will not be a really nice place to be as a human outside a vehicle. And we will hear from lots of people over the course of these all these debates who will have us believe that we can have that and eat it too, that cake and eat it too. Unfortunately, it's just not a thing. And we, I'm really delighted that council has come to, come again to the, the 30K speeds concept because it, it shows a real maturing in how we're thinking about the purpose of our streets in Wellington. 
So I only have two points because uh, many of the other speakers have covered things. The first one is that the drop-in speeds, and I'm talking real operating speeds here, not just the sign, a drop-in speeds from 50 kilometers an hour to 30 k's or less operating is kind of magic. And I'm summarizing up here a huge amount of research worldwide that basically boils down to when you drop those operating speeds, some unexpected and wonderful things happen in the streets. And the reason for this is because of the subconscious effect it has on us as humans. We've got a bunch of very old hardwiring in our brains that we've retained from our primate days that essentially make us slightly more alert, slightly more apprehensive when there are large things moving around that we know subconsciously could hurt us. Now, we're not, I'm not talking like we're processing, you know, 80% versus 85% odds. We just know subconsciously that there are some things out there that could hurt us. When that risk that we are subconsciously perceiving in the environment is significantly dropped in the way that it does when you go from 50 to 30 operating speeds for motor vehicles, the magic is that that anxiety is relieved. We are more relaxed. We're more literally looking around more and open to the possibilities that the street offers us. People look across the street more, they see things on the other side, they see people on the other side, they're more able to readily cross the street more often. You get people lingering in streets a lot more, more window shopping, more meeting people, more hanging out, and crucially, more spending. More window shopping, more incidental spending, more popping in lovely street environments where people are more relaxed equals money. And this, this basically enables a whole bunch of other things as well, like you can get the people cycling and scooting on the footpath off the footpath into the road because it is a safer place for them to be in the traffic lane, which is delightful. Second thing, self-explaining street environments are the way to go. We can change the sign, but the evidence all around the world and some great examples comparing London and New York show that changing the sign doesn't make the difference. You are going to hemorrhage effort into enforcement. What does make a difference is a thing called a self-explaining street environment. And this is basically a whole bunch of physical stuff installations that you put in the street to, again, affect us on a subconscious level. What the research has shown, and this has been borne out in Auckland and Christchurch and all over the, all over the country, you can signal to people what is a good and an appropriate pace to drive at. And without them feeling like they're being told by the man, they instinctively and of their own volition drive at what is a safe and appropriate speed. And the Vision Zero research shows that you can configure a self-explaining street or road environment to whatever you want. And the principles are used a lot uh, for, for safe highway environments, and safe know, arterial road environments. Thank you. The beauty with a self-explaining street environment at an inner city or a city street level or a residential street level is that the stuff you put in the street to encourage people to drive at the right speed can also be the stuff that makes that environment delightful to be in. You can put seating, you can put water fountains, you can put art, you can put parklets, you can put trees, you can put you know, green stormwater infrastructure, all of those different things. You can do it in, with an innovating streets or a tactical approach by putting movable planters or flexi posts or whatever, but you put the stuff in the street and it helps people slow down without feeling like they're being told. So those are is more effective and cheaper enforcement and making more delightful urban environments, which are good for all of us. So 50 to 30 is magic and let's do self-explaining street environments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isabella. I'm afraid you haven't left enough time for questions, so we'll be moving on to the next presenter. Lovely to see you. Um, who do I have next on my list? Jonathan Fletcher. Welcome, Jonathan. Jonathan, you're on mute. Thank you, Marina. Good morning, and thank you, Madam Chair and Councillors, uh, for this opportunity to do a presentation to you this morning. I think it's great that you're looking at managing and reducing the speeds in the central city. This combined with other works that I understand you have un underway on public, for example, improving public transport and changes to parking provision will make the central city more attractive to visit. And my main purpose of making a submission this morning is to make the point that as an older suburbanite, I value the central city and think it is a key part of Wellington's identity. 
the central city is the only public space not controlled by is, or is a public space not controlled by public interests and a place that you can it all can come at least once we deal with COVID-19 and and mix meet meet my meet our business needs shop be entertained and socialize so if, if as a council you focus on making it an attractive place to visit not only will it contribute to the well-being of the people of Wellington but as Isabella made the point, it will become a commercial success for those businesses that provide quality services. My second point is that visitors to the central city may arrive by car, public transport, or, by, or motorbike, or bicycle, but they participate and engage within the central city on foot. It is therefore key to the success of the central city that people moving around on foot find it easy enjoyable and safe. My test on the success of a central city is when can I bring my six-year-old grandchild or my elderly neighbor, or heaven help me if I'm brave enough, both at once, and not have to be constantly concerned that they will be at risk of injury. Designers are shopping malls, those places I love to hate, and in many ways the central city's comp competition know this very well. You arrive by car, but once you're in the building, you may roam safely without risk. In passing, I'd note that at least one in the larger malls, people may have to walk a couple of hundred meters or more from the outer fringes of the car park to the, to the building. So don't let people tell you that visitors to the central city have to be able to drive to right outside the point they wish to visit. It's not true. And um, obviously, as has been said, open space design is also important. The street furniture, plantings and paving and the general ambience must be pedestrian friendly and must make it easy for cyclists, mobility scooters, baby buggies and pedestrians to move around without conflict. Um, provision obviously needs to be made for motorized transport, but it needs to be provided so that people can come to the central city and the transport is routed around the central city and not through it. Thank you and best wishes for progressing this important work. Thank you, Jonathan. Councillor Swear, have questions? Councillor Rush? Yes, thanks, Jonathan. Hey, really good. I, I picked up on your um, written submission about the need for rooms and corridors, and I think your um, shopping mall analogy is a good one. So part of the Let's Get Wellington moving um, project involves taking a lot of traffic off the AT keys and, and, and allowing it to continue through the motorway through to the airport and to Miramar. So is that something that you would support in the vision of uh, this walkable city? Yes, very, very much so. I, I mean, there's a, the central city area itself is a reasonable pedestrian walkable space, walkable distance. That needs to be easily accessible and friendly but let's not forget that people do actually need to get from um, get around around that central city, get to that central city, and out to the airport and such and such things. So we do have to make provision. And at the moment, we're at the risk of doing neither well. Other questions, councillors? All right. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for coming in this morning. Really appreciate your time. And next on my list, I have Chris Watson. Hello. Um, Good morning. Thank you. Um, I would like to suggest that slower speeds are uh, a huge advantage for Wellington because of three reasons. Firstly, to stop killing and injuring people. Secondly, to clean up the environment for our health. And thirdly, to make Wellington or make more Wellington streets attractive and pure of the repulsive. So, um, I'm an architect and I, can you hear me? I've got. Thank you. Uh, I would like to. It's the feedback from Jonathan's. Um... Oh, can you hear me? Thanks, Chris. I think we were just having some feedback, but Jonathan's just muted himself. So I think we're probably oh, okay. good to go. 
Okay, I'll carry on. So Thank I'm you. an architect uh, speaking to you from my office here in Willow Street. And um, a lot of my experience that I bring to this uh, topic uh, comes from living in Germany for most of 2015 and um, in Oslo for most of 2017 and visiting numerous cities around there. And also much more recently during this uh, COVID isolation period, I was loaned a bike and I was able to bike around Wellington and it was quite delightful without the traffic. Um, so firstly, um, to stop killing and injuring uh, cyclists, walkers and others, um, uh, obviously slower speeds are going to uh, be a big part of that. And um, I'm just reminded of the fact that Helsinki um, in the last couple of years has reduced its uh, death toll down to uh, zero for pedestrians, um, uh, largely by reducing speeds. And that's you can read about that on the Smarter Cities website. Uh, secondly, to clean up for our health, um, Firstly, uh, in, in this acoustic environment, the soundscape as we call it, um, to make our streets quieter means that we can hear birds or people sounds or a conversation across the street. And that's been evident in the last few weeks as well with fewer, uh, with less traffic. And then of course the um, actual particulate and uh, uh, gas um, pollution, which is in, uh, injurious to our health. Um, nitrogen oxides uh, are poisonous for humans, and the tiny particles, the 2.5 micron particles, uh, particularly from diesel and um, petrol, the burnt particles, which are so small that they can penetrate our lung walls and cause us cardiac problems. So finally, um, I'd like to make, I'd like it if you would make more of Wellington streets attractive and fewer of them repulsive. Um, because streets can be places uh, for sitting, for having a coffee, for kids to play soccer and, and such like, and for biking around safely. And um, examples um, uh, all over the place in Europe, uh, dozens or hundreds of cities there, but um, some come to mind like Freiburg uh, and its newer suburbs of Vauban and Reiselfeld. And um, a couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of riding uh, bikes around Copenhagen and uh, The Hague. And of course, Copenhagen's famous uh, for the urban designer, Jan Gell, who said that we should be making our cities, well, if we make our cities safe for our under eight year olds or over 80 year old parents, we're making it much more pleasant for ourselves. So just for those three reasons, to stop killing and injuring people, to make it um, safe for human health and to make our city more attractive, I think you should reduce the speeds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Do I have some questions, councillors? I've got, well, I'll take one then. Chris, I'd love to know what, what's the, the one thing that you've seen in these overseas cities that you just absolutely wish we could do on our Wellington streets? Uh, well, pedestrian streets, uh, for example, every city in Germany that I can think of has its golden mile pedestrianized. And I realize there's a conflict with public transport here, which is you know coming down that golden mile, but we could do the adjacent streets all pedestrianized or, or other selected streets. So that means we have more streets that are like Cuba Mall and fewer streets that are like, say, the arterial keys, which are just repulsive and horrible for people, as opposed to being, you know, quite nice. And they do attract people uh, like Cuba Mall, for example, and the waterfront. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for that, Chris. Thanks for coming in this morning. Thanks. All right. My next uh, participant is Dave Hayes. Dave, good morning. G'day. Um, thanks for, uh, for the opportunity. Um, so I'm I'm really coming from a I'm a, a driver and a cyclist and it would seem that a lot of drivers don't think that cyclists are drivers so go figure but um, my submission was really around simplifying our speed limits and uh, looking at the average speed in a car the tick marks are at the 20k mark so primarily sort of 40 60 80 100 is where I'm coming from now I think that was the basis of my submission but I've had to do some research, of course, as you do, and I kind of, I think I've changed my mind a little bit. So <laughs> let me go through that. Um, safer speeds from the Oxford University Press. So this is the Journal of Public Health. It's volume 37, issue three. It was September 2015, having said that, but it's an umbrella review of the effects of 20 miles per hour, of course, because it's mainly European, uh, zones and limits. So there is a difference between those two. But 20 miles an hour, of course, is a shade over 30. It's 31 point something. 
Now, in that, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence states that reducing speed and traffic calming, so this is a zone, so it's, a, it's speed and traffic calming, so it's humps, uh, narrowing, um, people have talked about boxes and things like that on the road. Those two together uh, is what has to happen if the aim is to reduce casualties. Now, I think the submission is around safer speeds, not just slower speeds. So um, the zones reduce accidents, not limits alone. That's really what I got from uh, this paper. And this is an umbrella study. So there's, there was a couple of thousand, they whittled it down to a couple of hundred, uh, but ultimately they're saying zones reduce accidents, not limits alone. And to give you some numbers, 6% reduction in accidents for each one mile an hour reduction in speed. So the zones reduced average speed by nine miles an hour. That's because people were driving faster than the, the, the speed they wanted them to. So this is going from 25 miles an hour to 16 miles an hour. So when you introduce a zone, people drive slower than the limit. <laughs> and if you do the sums, that's a 54% reduction in accidents. That's compared to 25% by speed reduction alone. Okay, so reducing speed does reduce accidents, but not as much as a zone. Remember, it has speed humps and things as well. Uh, that paper led me to the UK government setting local speed limits. So section six in there, paragraph 68, set, states that having traffic calming should be every 50 meters. So if you're gonna put traffic calming in, there's no point in having it miles apart. You've gotta have them quite close. Paragraph 74, zones reduce mean traffic speed by more than the speed limit. We've already, already stated that. Um, also, it reduces collisions by 60%. So even their statement is sort of matches that umbrella statement as well. Now, these zones are not imposed where vehicle movement is the primary function. Okay, so you want to move vehicles, you don't do that. Uh, it goes on to say that signed only speed limits generally lead to small reductions in travel speeds, and it's only appropriate where speeds are already low. So if people are traveling 30, put limits, otherwise you'll need to put in a, 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 a speed zone as such. So uh, given that and my own observations, so as I said, I am a cyclist, so I cycle through Miramar and Strathmore, they've both got 30 k an hour um, speeds and there's pretty low compliance there. Um, I bike faster than 30 and I have cars going past me. So I'm, that's only from my observation. Uh, so you can imagine with traffic calming through Miramar and Strathmore, you'd expect those speeds to be quite low. And we could do that in the inner city. However, there has to be an incentive uh, for vehicles to avoid the 30k area. Ultimately, you want to push them off to um, to arterial roads. So I think 50 is too fast in residential zones. So imagine through Ira Street. Uh, You've got one Miramar. minute, Dave. Thanks. Uh, through Ira Street, through Miramar, I would like to see that as 40. Certainly, having a 30k zone, perhaps a zone through. Uh, Strathmore, so you could put a couple of speed humps in, say, through Strathmore, that would be fine. The rest of residential streets would be 40, uh, 60 on your arterials. So um, imagine the one ways, et cetera, being 60. So that's the northbound and southbound Highway 1. We'd have to avoid parking there to allow that, though. And then that leaves you 80 and 100 for the open road. And that's me. Great. Thank you, Dave. Other questions, councillors? Just yep, Rush. Dave, any chance you could find my email address and send me the reference to that or a link to that paper? Absolutely. Um, it's not in your submission, yes. is it? Yeah, that'd be great. No, no. Uh, it's what I found whilst I thought I'd better dig into this and make yeah. sure I'm not talking rubbish. I'm keen for that as well. Thank you. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, Dave, so what is your view now then on the, the 30K and the CBD um, proposal? Uh, so I think because traffic goes through there relatively slowly, you'd probably get away with the speed limit and that'll be fine. Um, but it's not going to make much difference um, ultimately to safety. I think that'd have to be a zone if safety is your priority. If you want to stop killing people in the central city, it has to be a zone. You've got to put in those speed humps and everything else. Or indeed, as other sub submitters have said, uh, pedestrianise it. Uh, that would be a big ask in the area you're talking about. 
Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, Dave, for coming in this morning and for all the research that you've done and for changing your mind when you read something new. <laughs> that's always something that we love to see as well. <laughs> yep. Thanks so much, Dave. Thanks. My next speaker is Russell Trigon, and good morning, Russell. Good morning, and uh, kia ora, and thanks for all your good work. I strongly support lowering city speeds to help shift people from driving to active transport. I'm a keen cyclist and commute that way. This will improve people's health and create a more livable city and climate. So important these days. And over the years, I've lost uh, a lot of sleep patching up victims of road trauma. And when I've advised patients to rehab after surgery by cycling, here's what they tell me. No way, doctor. It's far too dangerous on our streets. Those cars go far too fast. So next slide. Uh, no, no, sorry, back, back one, thanks. So what's the Health, Health Act says 1956? It shall be the duty of every local authority to improve, promote and protect public health within its district. I couldn't find one law that said you should be making people go through your city as fast as possible. I, I could be corrected, but you, I couldn't find one. Next slide, please. So it's all about physics. We've heard already from others. It's the velocity squared that's important. It's exponential. So the kinetic energy absorbed by a body, bones, all the things that I've had to patch up, at 30 kims is only 36% of that at 50. That makes a huge difference to the injury and the amount of um, trauma to, to the musculoskeletal system where I work. Next, please. Let's get Wellington moving. Their main aim, more people moving with fewer vehicles. And then they say, with a growing population, it's crucial that more people use public transport, walk or bike. Safer central city speeds will help encourage this. But then they make exceptions. The Keys, Taranaki Street, Cable Street, SH1, they encourage people to drive through the city faster. Retaining these CBD streets at 50 actually flouts the principles that Let's Get Wellington Moving is promoting. Next slide. You know what KISS means. Don't confuse people with different speeds. The streets that LGWM want to exclude from 30 are all busy. SH1 goes right through the heart of the city. Different if we had a ring road, we don't. It goes right through our city with lots of pedestrians going across. And also hopefully cyclists will be able to use these streets when it's made safer for them with proper separated and joined up cycling lanes. The government principle we've just seen so well in the last seven weeks in handling the um, pandemic threat, and that is health is all important. And it's, and it's the law. So for my, uh, I, what I would like you to see is make all the city speed limits consistent, safe and healthy at 30 kims and no more. Thanks, are there any questions? Thank you, Russell. Uh, Councillor Paul. Yeah, I'm gonna try my best, but I know my Wi-Fi quality isn't very good. So if I cut out, just skip me. Um, uh, Kia ora, um, Russell, thank you for that um, presentation. It was really insightful from someone who has to deal with the after, aftermath of the way that our roads are laid out. Um, I was wondering, you talked about Taranaki Street and some of the keys and why they weren't included and how this floods the principles of let's get one to moving. Originally, the um, proposal, you know, there were, there were amendments put up around the time saying um, we could consider Taranaki Street, but these were in the end omitted. One of the reasons was that it would have taken a lot longer to carry out the, I guess, canvassing work on these streets. Would you have preferred that we take it, uh, that we took a longer time to deal with this if we, if we were to include those keys in Taranaki Street, or would you prefer a quicker outcome now, including the streets we're currently surveying, and then moving on to the next tranche of safer speed streets, if that makes sense? 
Thanks. I don't see any reason to slow down the um, 30 kims throughout the city. It just means more injury, uh, more accidents. I hope. Just get, let's let's just do it. My view. All right, Councillor Rush. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Um, hi, hi, Russell. Um, so you mentioned um, that we don't have a ring road uh, around uh, Wellington for State Highway 1, but that does seem to be part of the Let's Get Wellington moving plan. So is that you'd support that extension of the motorway through to Miramar? I know, I'm talking about a ring road going around the city. It goes through. Okay. All right, thanks. We don't have enough, uh, you know, geography to allow us to have a ring road. That was my point. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Thank you, Russell, for coming in this morning. We really appreciate having you here and, and sharing your experiences. Um, the next speaker I have on my list is Angela Rothwell. Angela, you're here with us um, from the Mount Vic Residents Association. So you have 10 minutes and I'll let you know when you have one minute to go. I'll probably need about three. Okay. So. <laughs> um, right. So our, I know that Everybody who's talked before me has said the same things as what I would say if I was just talking about your brief. Um, we know that 30K keeps everybody safer on the roads. We want to support the Wellington Towards 2040 ideas around a people-centred city, an eco-city, a connected city, a dynamic central city. But mostly what we're about at Mount Victoria Residents Association is the people who live in our community and they straddle all the population areas from cradle to grave. And all of those people need to be kept safe. They need to learn to ride bikes on the road. And for that, we've got our tiny little streets and they can't be widened. So we need the traffic to be calmed. We've got people learning, kids learning to walk, elderly people who are a bit wobbly, people using wheelchairs, people who are, have less visibility than is normal. And they all need to be looked after and kept safe. And we think 30 Ks throughout Mount Victoria would help that. What we see with this proposal is that we would have 30K within the CBD, and then if it was just you know, brought in 30K within the CBD, then people would explode onto, you know, we already see it exploding up Pirie Street, up Marjorie Bank Street, going very quickly into the residential area, which I think Dave Hayes made a good point. The residential areas are not appropriate for high speeds. Um, we want to see the speed come down. And we think that Mount Victoria being quite self-contained geographically would be a good place to test that out, to bring the uh, road speed limit down all over. We also would like to see that Kent and Cambridge Terrace have their limit brought down to 30k per hour. Um, and I think as Sean made the comment in the previous hearing, that the traffic around the Basin Reserve would really support a slower speed going in and out of, of the Basin anyway, so it shouldn't be any particular change in behaviour. Um, we'd like to see a 30k limit on the Cable and Wakefield area as well. That would remove the mental block that a lot of pedestrians and cyclists have about how to get safely onto the waterfront or back from the waterfront into the Mount Vic area. Lowering the speed limit at Kent and Cambridge would also lower that same mental block towards travel in and out of the CBD on foot or by cycle. And that's really all we have to say. Thank you, Angela. I've got a question from Councillor Young. Councillor Young. Hi, Angela. So um, you're right about some of the speeds. I, um, are you aware that some of the car dealers use Pirie Street as, an, as a place to exam, um, demonstrate acceleration when they're doing test drives with clients. Yeah, uh, it's it's mostly it's, them that I'm thinking about when so, I'm talking um, about. Have the Mount Victoria Residents Association um, approached council about making Mount Victoria um, a reduced speed limit, safer speed limit area? I know I've had some emails. I have to say, for those who don't know, two of the Lambton councillors live on Mount Victoria, uh, Councillor Panett and me. Um, so we know it pretty well. So has the Residents Association made any overtures to Council about reducing speed limits? We have mentioned it a bunch of times, yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, thank you. Councillor Panett. 
Sorry, thanks Angela, um, and thanks for your question, Nicola. Um, yes, um, MVRA actually has really approached us and I have followed up with officers. Um, so I guess my question is, Angela, um, would this have broad um, community support, including from the schools, do you think? And would you be happy to work with your ward councillors to progress this pr proposal? That'd be a yes on both of those. We've had quite a lot of feedback, more than we have about other things, about the lowered road speed limit. Um, I'll be in touch again to just to talk about how we move that forward. Thanks so much. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Angela. Any other questions, councillors? Councillor Rush? I won't ask about building another tunnel, uh, Angela. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I, I just I, I just like to reach out to you. I think um, you know the people in Rosedeath might also be wanting to join that conversation. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I think um, Councillor Foon. And the people from Newtown as well. I, I can. I think we're all singing from the same song sheet. <laughs> I think so. And I think I think the lockdown has given people an opportunity to see what life is like with that karma traffic. And we all really quite like it. Yeah. Yeah, it's been our one silver lining, hasn't it? Mm. Um, I think, and I think it's uh, from conversations I've had with officers, that we've, they've definitely the plan is to extend the 30k limit into some of our inner city fringe areas um, but the this is you know the old um, eating an elephant one bite at a time um, you know we decided that the CBD would be one bite and we would take that in one piece and then we can move on to other areas so it sounds like um, there's definitely interest in Mount Vic uh, to be one of the first um, of those to, to have 30ks come to your part of the world. Oh, that would be lovely. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, Angela. Any other questions, Councillor? No, we're good. All right, thank you so much for coming okay. in this morning, Angela. Nice thank to see you. you. All right, I've got Paul Bruce is next on my speaker list. In a koto, councillors, called Paul Bruce, Tauko Ingenara. Thanks for the opportunity to present to you. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Wellington Civic Trust as well as myself. The, propo the proposal for 30K and the CBD is a great step towards making Wellington a truly livable city, taking us into a similar place to those great European towns that Chris Watson mentioned. However, the proposal does, just doesn't go far enough. We urge councillors to amend the motion for the 30K limit to encompass the whole of the CBDs. That is Webb Street northwards to Wellington Railway Station, Thorned onto Tinakori Road and west to east from Willow Street through to Cambridge Terrace and the Keys and, and um, of course Mount Victoria. <laughs> um, traffic struggles to travel faster than 30k even on Vivian Street. Those that speed up to 50k between traffic lights put people at risk. They stress us all and degrade the shopping environment and the cafe culture that we celebrate. We need a consistent speed limit that applies throughout the complete CBD so that there is no doubt as to what applies. 30K zones everywhere, along with innovating street traffic calming street design would be very positive for everyone, for city residents, workers and shoppers, for public transport users, for cyclists and pedestrians. 30K over the entire CBD would encourage new visitors to our city, making the city more vibrant and attractive to everyone. And most of all, that would make our city safe with no more deaths. Our Civic Trust Board meeting discussed 30K and wondered how to include State Highway 1. We found that state highways do have restrictions, in particular near schools where they exist. The Civic Trust recommendation is that Wellington City Council consults with NZTA on safer speeds for Vivian Street. Vivian Street has a number of retail outlets and those wanting to pull off to visit, the, um, for example, the camera shop or the Mac computer sales have great difficulty in doing this safely in fast moving traffic on relatively narrow lanes. And greater conflicts of course occur at intersections where pedestrians wait to cross and high speed traffic creates a huge barrier to people accessing Tiaro. Thank you for putting the speed restrictions on a higher road in Brooklyn, where I live. There have been no campaigns against that 30 speed restriction because everybody understands its importance, given the conflict between shoppers, pedestrians, and the large number of, of trucks 
heading towards the Happy Valley landfall. I have cycled um, from Brooklyn through Wellington CBD for 45 years on a daily basis. And of course, I've had lots of near misses, um, but I've grown accustomed to them. I, however, I've never got used to those big trucks and cars speeding past me with only inches to spare. We would like to see a CBD 30K zone that includes Vivian Street. 30K is in fact the best practice design described in the NZTA manual where vehicles share roads with cyclists and significant number of pedestrians. Yeah, councillors, please consider extending the 30K zone to the whole of the Wellington CBD. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Paul. Uh, councillors, do we have any questions for Paul? Oh, Councillor Foon? Um, Paul, that's incredible to hear that you've been cycling for 45 years in Wellington. <laughs> if you could share the experience that you've seen and the difference over that time, how, how would you explain that to us? Oh, thank you very much for your um, question. Um, yes, well, um, I found it gradually got worse from when I started cycling in 1972. Um, you know, I, I lived in a number of different flats, so I cycled every, you know, from every direction. Um, it actually was worse in um, about 2005, six, seven, or eight. And there just seemed to be a total disregard. And I wondered why that happened. And I think it was because the number of people cycling increased. And initially the traffic was angry at cyclists. Why? You shouldn't be on the road. And that was the, a lot of people gave you the fingers and told you, get off the road. And, and they would deliberately turn in front of you. However, um, the number of cyclists uh, still increased. And I think it was the Wellington City Council um, measures like putting um, advanced stop by boxes. I mm. thought initially, oh, that's a bit of a waste of time. But I think it actually means it indicated that the council supported cyclists in the city and gradually um, car drivers, you know, were more conscious of, of cyclists. And I think behavior um, of, of vehicle drivers um, have, has actually improved considerably over the last um, five to 10 years. Um, and of course, any, um, we actually do need safe, safe cycleways, um, especially along the quays. I, I always bike along um, um, the quays because if I'm going from, um, you know, Brooklyn through to the railway station because it's faster, but I have that conflict with cars, you know, um, moving inches away from me and, mm. and it is a bit frightening, but I still don't do it, but you should take out a lane as well on the, on the quays. And then um, that was promised when the Cairo Drive was, was before it was built, that, that was agreement that, that you take out one lane out of the keys for a, for a cycleway and it has never happened. Um, it would be a huge improvement as well, plus the 30 Ks through them. Great. Thank you, Paul. And if you did find that document about Cairo Drive, I know we'd all be interested in looking at that, please. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, apologies for not getting it thank, to you. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Yay. Thanks, Paul. Um, sorry, Councillor Young, we've run out of time, if that's all right. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Paul, for coming in today. Really appreciate having you here. And my last speaker for the morning is Igor Albanet. Thank you, Igor, for your patience sitting through all of the other presenters. Uh, really appreciate that. And away over to you. Can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me, guys? Yes. Yes, thanks. Sorry. Um, yeah, it was great to, to hear everyone else. So um, I think I'm going to try to summarize and skip over some of the uh, points that have been made. But trying to um, to bring to mind the, uh, the opportunity um, that uh, we're facing now after the, um, the COVID uh, lockdown and the, uh, the, the more strategic move that we may need to think about as opposed to just um, speed limits. Um, so um, my presentation is simple, it's the case for slower. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to make basically three points. It's um, slower speed um, is a case for the economy. And we all know how bad we're going to get after uh, where we are now. So a, uh, there is an economic uh, component to it. And there is a 
an environment component to a slower speed. And some people have talked about that um, uh, before me. And there is, of course, a case for health, right? And that's where most of the safety um, components is. Um, there, there's an underlying current that I think has been mentioned is uh, more about um, less roads and, and more streets in the idea that um, our way of moving in the city needs to be less car centric and more shared uh, between different modes of movement and cyclists and uh, vulnerable uh, people are key in our concerns at this stage and we should reflect that as a as a key driver for uh, action in council next please so uh, on the uh, case for the economy um i think it's been mentioned that our streets are basically um the platform for economic exchange in cities and we should think about that as opposed to just a place to move um without streets there is no street economy point uh, and, and return there. So we need to make sure that streets are um, um, welcoming the accessibility and a slower um, pace to uh, uh, attract more people and, and more activity if we want to be uh, successful as a city. We want to make sure that we consider the movement of freight and servicing businesses and premises as well as people. So it's not just designing for the uh, uh, individual car or just the public transport. It's also all the other things that need to happen on that street and need to make sure that we uh, regulate and, and promote um, a slow move of everything in there. And lastly, it's, it's a question, yes, it's a question of economy and, and mobility, and it, there's a tension there, but it can be resolved in more than one way. Um, and, and we need to think of um, innovative ways of achieving really good um, um, commercial activity with really good mobility. People have done that elsewhere, so it's not uh, something we need to invent. Next, please. Okay. So on the environment side, there's a, a few uh, key points that uh, we need to think about. For example, if we're seeing um, green infrastructure as a key component of slowing um, down speed, and, and I'm not going to uh, dig further into the design components of slower streets because um, it's going to take a bit of time, but basically a road sign is not going to slow down uh, significantly. Um, uh, as, uh, street traffic, it's, it's, it's more effective to have perceptual and physical components. Uh, I think uh, um, I think it was Isabella who talked about uh, this before, so I'm just going to skip over that. But um, think of something like green infrastructure as a, as a help for our um, really uh, intensive um, um, bad state of our um, uh, uh, wastewater infrastructure as a component of how we uh, improve that, but also air pollution, as it was mentioned before, and, um, and um, the, um, the overall, one yeah, and the overall um, um, livelihood of the streets. And next, which is kind of my last. So health, it's been mentioned that, you know, the reduction of speed is a reduction in, in likelihood of uh, death and, and serious injury. So there's no question around that, but um, there's one point that we need to make sure we, we consider now. And um, I just heard yesterday that um, Brussels is um, reducing the speed limit to 20 kilometers per hour across the whole city, just after COVID to allow people to uh, actually be able to use the streets a bit more than uh, than in a car or in a bicycle. So uh, please consider um, the short term changes that we need to make, as well as the uh, long term thirty kilometers um, that we're gonna uh, ideally head into. And the last one. So um, I think it was mentioned uh, before the Scandinavian examples of um, how to achieve this. So it's not just a regulation of putting the under road sign. There's a lot of work that needs to happen around safety systems in, in the um, design of the street and um, a, a lot of uh, moving parts in, in the conversation. So please don't assume that changing the road sign is gonna achieve the outcome that we're all looking for. Um, we need to do a bit more work than that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Igor. Um, and that's your time for this morning. So thank you again for coming in. Um, and
Yeah, and lots of waves and thank yous. Um, so at this point, um, we are going to adjourn the meeting and return at 1pm today, the 12th of May. And I have in my notes here that I need a seconder for this motion because we're adjourning for more than one hour. Councillor Rush, thank you so much. Uh, Heidi, do we need to f then vote on that motion? Yes, you do, please. All right, so then let's majority. put that to the vote, please. Councillor Young. How are we doing, Heidi? Just waiting on Councillor Young. Something's wrong, Nicola. I can see that something's wrong. All right. I think we'll just we'll just take it. That's a that the number of votes we've got is enough for a majority, so I don't think we need to worry about technical difficulties. Is that all right, Heidi? Can we that's Condi. Sorry. Yes. Just to just to butt in quickly. Um we because you moved the original motion, we need somebody else to move the, the motion to adjourn. Oh okay, of course oh, we sorry, do. Sorry, if we can just find somebody to swap that up. Let's tidy that up for you. Thank you, Councillor Calvert. So, Councillor Calvert would uh, will move the amendment, and Councillor Rush can second it. All right. Thank you. Excellent. So, is that us sorted out to adjourn? Dot eyes dotted, t's crossed. Yes. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you, Heidi. Wonderful cheering. Thank you, Councillor Condi. <laughs> you would never have known it was your first hearing. <laughs> yeah, congratulations, Thank you very Jenny. Much. Well done. <laughs> all right. And we're all going to be back at one o'clock uh, for this meeting to continue. I'll see you then maybe five minutes beforehand just so that we're all here and in, in, in good stead. Uh, enjoy your lunch. Awesome. So, yeah. <laughs>